I will be out January. Dwight will be leading the show in January if there is a meeting. Anyone have any problems with any of those dates? Okay, adoption of the minutes. Everyone had a chance to review them? We did do a revision to the minutes from the right. first packet that you got just to incorporate more of the comments that were given to the planning board regarding the airport. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? I'll abstain. I wasn't supposed to Um, well, we're back in our home court after uh, several away games, which I think were, were valuable. I mean, we got to see a lot of the facilities that we vote on for capital budget projects, and, uh, and uh, there was affordable housing, there was Playland, there was the jail, uh, there was the airport. College and the college right so you know we really got to see a lot of the projects I think we'll be more familiar with some of the requests that come in in the future so I, th I think it was valuable and uh, maybe we should think when weather gets nice again next year to think if there are some others that uh, um, I was thinking that uh, maybe the bus garage and the bus uh, the uh, beeline system would be one and I'm sure there's another <coughs> park that uh, would be useful to see and uh, that's in the future. Commissioner? Uh, I do want to actually introduce two of our brand new staff. Um, first we'll introduce Millie McGraw who's uh, an Hello. environmental planner. She's going to be handling the East of Hudson program uh, and the a new septic repair program that we're going to be pulling together very shortly. And then right next to Millie is Michael Vernon, who is our new planner, uh, who will be working with Lucas most directly as backup and doing handling a lot of the referrals. So as he gets more on board, um, you'll, you'll start seeing Michael do some of the presentations and review. He did actually do your first letter on the Mount Kisco comprehensive plan. So, um, so Michael is coming to us after his experience both at East Chester and Port Chester. So he's had, and was an intern in our office East Chester, Port Chester, ago. West Chester. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, uh, and we, uh, and just along the lines, we are, uh, we have somebody has accepted our offer of coming on board as our new housing director. She will be starting in December. She's getting her paperwork done right now. So until she's actually approved by HR, you know, I just don't want to put a name out there. But um, we will be bringing a housing director on board, which will be very helpful for me because it's uh, it still takes a lot of my time to be able to just keep everything moving that we've got going. Um, the only other thing I wanted to comment on was that a couple of weekends ago I had the opportunity to go to Lasden Park speaking along the lines of where you may want to visit next year. Um, you know the uh, there's a train show and the place was set up the mansion was set up for Halloween which was just absolutely incredible just um, I happen to like villages mm -hmm. and you know little setups with trains so that was you know took a Saturday and you know went down and and it was just really the dinosaur land outside yeah, yeah. was just you know re, re, you know although my husband was not thrilled to be walking around because it was a damp day um, it, was a rainy day. it was a rainy day right but it was just um, absolutely worth the time and effort to go and just walk around um, somebody had you know a lot of people have a lot of imagination about how they set up the place so um, but the new glass house uh, was up and so again as capital projects that you see that Lasden may be one of those places that uh, you may want to go to County Planning Board actually did a retreat there probably 15 years ago Is that long? it's a long time ago I think um, so you know so it may be something that one of those places unfortunately it's really northern Westchester so for uh, Rini and for others coming from southern Westchester might be a little bit of a hike but it was really you know again get in terms of getting you out there if, to the extent that you can give me ideas of where else you other things you'd like to see. Um, I was thinking about the material recovery facility, but you know we have to be there the right time of year, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, but uh, there are definitely other facilities that you um, make and uh, take approvals of different or make, make recommendations on. So um, when you get a chance, just let give me any other ideas that you'd like us to look at. And that's pretty much it for me. 
Now that you have an environmental planner, maybe we could get a report on the east of Hudson millions of dollars that have been both spent and maybe still available for sewers in, uh, I think the city put up 40 million or something like 38 that. 38 million, 38 yeah. 38 million. Um, 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> And it has, I assume it has not yet all been committed. I know some of it has been committed. Well, the, actually, the, the <coughs> uh, okay, yes, we'll make it a point to have yeah. a presentation done. Yeah. We are in the process. We're going to meet with the um, communities late November, later this month, with the county executive to talk about moving the program forward and just how to move those the last millions of dollars and get some things done. So because That's crucial to development in North County, but and affordable housing as well as uh, sure. market rate housing. Okay, good. Okay, the referrals. You have in your package the referrals from September 16th through October 15th. Um, some of these we discussed. Some of them, I think you got letters. If you can take a look. I don't know if anyone needs to recuse themselves on any of these. Uh, this time I don't. Any comments on any of them? I think one of the issues there is um, the issue of shuttles, which uh, I know that Lucas has been working on. And uh, Avalon in Austin wants to get rid of their shuttle, but another proposal in Austin is saying they're going to have a shuttle. So it's uh, we talked about that at, the, at one of the previous meetings. and. Uh, it's, use, it's often used to get an increase in density, and then if it disappears, you know, who knows? So uh, I think that's something we need to keep our eye on, and it's been in a couple of the referrals. But if there are no questions. Can I have a motion to approve Just the referral? One quick thing. Yeah. Uh, under Hidden Cove on the Hudson, we know site plan review is not under county planning board jurisdiction. That's right. What is, what's the exception there? What's going on? Um, because it's more than 500 feet from any jurisdictional okay. trigger. That's why. So we reviewed it for the zoning. The zoning amendments were um, <coughs> under jurisdiction. But yeah, when it comes down to the site plan, it's too far away from anything that makes it. Okay. Um, I measured with a ruler, uh, you know, on the map and stuff. It was, it was like 800 <laughs> feet okay. away from Old Croton Aqueduct was the closest uh, jurisdictional trigger. Actually, this this comes up to the issue that all the presentations and by the way Lucas did a very good job presenting the to all the local right. municipal officials as to what generates a referral and what doesn't and the confusion between state law and county charter and it's something I think we need to try to yeah. reconcile but I guess that's one of the issues that normally you would think would but it turns mm -hmm. out it doesn't okay can I have a motion to I'll move. I'll do I Michael, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, referrals of interest, 900 King Street redevelopment. Okay, so this is a, um, a referral that we just wanted to run by you before we send the letter out. Uh, so there's a draft letter in your packets uh, that we already wrote. Um, this is for a draft environmental impact statement. Uh, so this is for a zoning text amendment, the PUD concept plan and site plan approval. And uh, we'll just take a quick look at it. So this is from 900 King Street, which you can kind of make out in the map. It's uh, basically it's right on the, the it's on King. It's actually off of Arbor Drive, which is a side road um, that comes off of King Street. And in this particular case, King Street is the boundary between Connecticut and New York State. And the site is also um, the site is also right next to the Hutchinson River Parkway. Uh, this is an aerial of the site. You can see here, this is the site right here. So it has access off of Arbor Drive, which is from King Street. This is um, like the village municipal complex with Village Hall and the police department. Down Arbor Drive, this is a um, existing um, multifamily development called the Arbors. And then over here is the Blind Brook Middle School High School campus. So it's a 17.77 acre site and it contains this uh, building in this parking lot. Um, the building is vacant. So this is the proposed plan. Um, it is to demolish the building in the parking lot and to build a large building that um, includes 160 one, two, and three bedroom units within an independent living facility. So this is the independent living building right here. 
Uh, 85 units of assisted living and me memory care, which is going to be in this wing right off to the side of the building. Then there's going to be 24 two-bedroom residential townhouses. That's in this area over here that's adjacent to the other multifamily townhouse development called the Arbors. All units will be restricted to 55 years uh, of age or older, and um, as per the village zoning ordinance, 19 units or 10% are set aside as affordable AFFH units, and that 10% um, that will be distributed evenly across the unit types. So the approvals that are required, um, well, the site is located within um, the PUD district, which, inter interestingly, the PUD district predates the village. It was set up by the town of Rye before the village of Rybrook was incorporated. Um, and that's when that office building was built. Uh, so what they want to do is they're, they're petitioning to add a new site-specific section within the village zoning ordinance to the PUD regulations to accommodate this development. The, in the village ordinance, the, basically everything that was PUD that carried over from the town, they, they had site-specific regulations for each of these PUD sites in the ordinance. So this would just create a new section for this site. Uh, the the um, zoning amendments would basically allow uh, an increased uh, density on the site. Um, it would increase the uh, building height and other site-specific bulk and area requirements. And it would set the age for senior living facilities at 55 instead of at 62. Um, after these uh, zoning amendments um, are approved, they would need a, a PUD concept plan approval and then a site plan approval. So we... we put a couple of draft comments in the letter that we just wanted to get your thoughts about before we send the letter to the village. Um, when it comes to Westchester 2025, it's kind of a mixed bag with this project. I mean, it's not located in the downtown center. It doesn't have access to public transportation. Um, counties, Beeline bus routes don't go to this part of Rybrook. Um, but at, at, on the at the same time, you know, this is an existing developed site and this is an infill project, so it's taking an underutilized site and it's developing it. So that's not a bad thing either. Uh, it does include the 10% set aside of affordable AF AFH units, which is good. Um, and it's interesting that this is that, is that for all aspects, the assisted yeah. living? Yes. Uh, all the way across. Mm -hmm. And. Um, this development is also within walking distance, as I showed you, of the school campus, um, and I'll get to it later, but there's also a, a, a neat little um, trail network that's around that school that connects the school campus to surrounding sites. In fact, this is, this is the map that shows the, um, the pathway network. So the school is here, the site is here, but these pathways um, are actually, in some cases, these pathways are on their own lots. Um, they're not you know, part of, like going through someone's backyard, they're actually like, well, they're going through someone's backyard, but they're, they're on their own lot. <laughs> um, so there's a path down here, and then there's a path up here that goes straight to the, de the development site. And in fact, the applicant is proposing to extend this particular pathway even further into the site, m really kind of connecting this site to the school campus. Um, and here's a, what it would look like on the, on the aerial. So, but unfortunately, because this is going to be senior restricted, there won't be any students who are able to take advantage of this pathway to walk to the school. It will, no children will be allowed to live in this, um, in this development. I was there the other day, and I think there's a fence along the school property. Line. Right. There's a fence um, along here. Yeah. That's why they have the pathways that go in where there is no fence. So this, this pathway is kind of wacky, you kind of going through the back of the site near like the football field. It's not, it's almost like an unofficial entrance. But it's very clear when you look at the aerial photos and stuff that there's a path that goes right in there. And this connects the village complex with the school. This is like kind of the front door of the school. So it would be very easy for someone to walk from, from one of these townhouses, for example, into the school, just up Arbor Drive and then into the school campus very uh, quick commute for a lucky student who wouldn't get to live there under the proposed project. Um, the other two comments were just mostly about um, how the EIS scope and the EIS document were not, there were, there were things that were in the EIS scope that did not get discussed in the EIS document. And two of these had to deal with comments that 
this board made on the EIS scope, which was to have a discussion about food composting for the um, food service operation in the assisted living and independent living um, building, and also to include a discussion about bicycle access and parking. Like I said, the site is not really on any public transit line. However, it is within a close biking distance of um, the Port Chester train station, and in the future, Beeline buses will start having bike racks on the front of them, and this is what you could call last mile. You know, you can take transit almost to the site, but not quite, and someone might want to use bicycle to get that last mile. That's a tough bike ride. King Street is a very busy street. You, but if you ride bikes, you know how to kind of piece it together, like, you know, um, you may find yourself riding on those uh, on the sidewalk. <laughs> 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 well, well, this is more for the employees of the assisted living facility. You know, where you may not make a lot of money, and it may save you, you know, um, to not own a, a multiple cars in your household. And you know, this might be something where someone could get to work on a bicycle. <laughs> This is controversial in Portchester. Um, first of all, apparently Rybrook didn't notify Portchester that this was coming up until uh, the very last minute. I think the public hearing was last night, I think it might have been. There's another one. No, yeah, there's one tomorrow. Tomorrow. There was, there was, yeah. right. there was yeah. one last month. Right. Um, so Portchester was a little ticked off about that. And right now, Portchester, due to another project, is concerned about traffic on King Street particularly across from the King Street School. And uh, they are fighting a two-lot subdivision in Porchester. Two lots. There's an existing house. Wanna, it's had a fire. They want to create two <coughs> lots. And they're saying you can't build the two lots subdivision because there's too much traffic on King Street. <laughs> they, look <laughs> at, they look at this and they say, hmm, they've requested the state to put a traffic signal opposite the King Street School and the state turned them down. They said the warrants don't justify a traffic signal. And so this is, so Portchester will have representatives at the public hearing. I'm not saying what, that's my opinion, because I think fighting a two-lot subdivision is a little ridiculous. Uh, but I think <coughs> regarding this project, uh, there will be traffic implications. How was that studied in the EIS? Um, same way as always studied. They do a study, oh, no they problem. say it'll work, and move on. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> no improvements to King Street are, are planned or indicated from the study? Uh, I'd have to go back and, and look at it. Um, you know, I'm not t nothing sticks on my memory, but I can, I can certainly go back and look. I think using the school as sort of a partial justification for building this where normally 2025 patterns would not recommend I think is a stretch the, the reuse of an existing site as an infill uh, maybe that supersedes the 2025 uh, uh, issue but um, I'm not sure unless I don't know if this board would recommend that the townhouses be for families and not, and not for, it's a se whole separate little area there. Uh, if that were for families, then obviously the school would have some uh, impact on, uh, a positive impact, but uh, they have not indicated that they want to do that, I assume. Oh, no. That, I think uh, you're right, Richard, that that's, that's the linkage with the school. Otherwise, I just, I see it just like uh, as an infill project, it makes sense to do it. And if you look at what else is around, across from the schools and other residential development stuff, it's a, there's a certain logic to it, even though it's not in a, an existing center. But if you want to bring the schools in, then it, we should be recommending that the townhouses be for families. That, that would make sense to me. Do they give an indication of the number of employees that would be at this facility? Uh, it's buried in the document, I'm sure. It, it's, um, honestly, I've reviewed so many of these now that, uh, I mean, there's, there, there's a, there's basically a certain number, they work on shifts, you know. I was just going to say, the yeah. shift hours, if they, you know, work with the, I mean, you can't drive on King Street.
from like 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning, there are three or four schools and school buses are up and down that, that street. You literally, I mean, you can take half an hour to go a mile mm -hmm. on because of all the school buses. So uh, who knows? I, I, I don't know what their shifts are, but that could be an issue. Well, I mean, the, uh, that if they shifts are at 6 yeah. or 7 a.m., then, you know, then that would be... They could adjust those problem. shifts if they, if they wanted to. And there are other assisted living facilities, several other assisted living facilities on King Street within a couple of miles of this facility. Any other comments? Do you have anything else you want to add? No, to? no, no. Any other comments <coughs> on? Uh, they got a split. Hmm? A split for the for the project. Has a split been done and uh, either accepted, not necessarily approved, but accepted, so that you know going forward what the impacts are of stormwater. Like have to, have they done the? Oh, storm? yeah. That's yeah. part of the. Um, I I don't know if it's been completed yet, but it's it's there's definitely stormwater section like in the. Uh, in the EIS. It would have to be accepted for them to go forward. Also, a lot of trees coming down in, in the uh, townhouse area, I think, in particular. <coughs> not not where the, the revised building is, but, uh, but it's set way back off of King Street. I mean, you can't even see, you can't even see the current building from King Street. It's yeah. set that far it's back. It's behind Village Hall. Hall. Hmm? It's behind Village Hall. Yeah. Any other comments you want to take another shot at maybe revising the issue of the uh, school and maybe suggesting you know taking it out of the 2025 okay. part but putting it as a separate part as a connection to maybe family housing okay so you want me to rewrite the first um, the first comment of the, of the three comments, I should just write, rewrite the first comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think that would be a good idea. Okay. Interesting, there's one, two, and three bedrooms, and it's all senior. The three bedrooms really implies that there'll be uh, three people. Right. Yeah, and I mean. So it's kind of strange in a way. Go over that the list of breakdown of units again. Uh, I don't have the exact um, breakdown. It's just uh, it's a mix. It, and the assisted living is the that upper right corner. Is that what it says? Right. That's yeah. the wing that's on the right, upper right corner. So it's a separate entrance, separate right. wing. Right. Um, three yeah, three bedrooms is unusual in yes. in they're implying independent no living. Kids. There's no kids. There's yeah, no yeah, kids wouldn't be allowed to live here at all. Like, it's not like you have to be 55 and you could ha have a dependent minor. There's like, no children. Period. There are legal yeah. issues there, but yeah. Yeah. that's not our call. Hmm. You might want to question and put in the letter, you know, what are the three bedrooms? Yes. Uh, what's, what's the reason for including three bedrooms? In it? I suppose it could be couple and a caregiver I mean mm -hmm. that's certainly one possibility it's although in assisted way. living you don't usually independent that's living rather problem. you don't usually have that's a that's living, that's living that's caregiver you right. so most people would still be working at 55 right you know, 62 you might be retired but 55 Okay, so maybe take another shot at that and okay. send it around. Yeah, we have time for that. Uh, the hearing is again tomorrow, and they won't close the hearing for at least ten days. So probably more, probably you more. might also, I mean, I don't take another look at the traffic section, see if they dealt with the school bus issue, and maybe you want to put something in there because I mean I've driven that. Well, when I drove, when we met at the airport, and that's the way I went up King Street. And I was say, wait, I mean, I get here on time. You know, I left myself plenty of time, and it was, it was so slow because of all the school buses. Okay, great. So I will try to circulate something in the next uh, <coughs> couple days. Okay. Uh, next. So this is a new one. Um, this you may have read about in the, in the news, actually, uh, and it was just referred to us last week with a lead agency. It was just 
lead agency notification. Nothing, nothing very substantial was submitted to us. Just a like a small eight and a half by eleven packet. Uh, but this is for what they're calling Somers Academy, which will be at the vacant IBM campus in Somers on top of the hill. And they will need a number of approvals for this. A comprehensive plan amendment, a zoning text amendment, a special permit, a subdivision, and a site plan approval for this one. So many things make this jurisdictional to the County Planning Board. If you're not familiar with where the site is, um, if you're driving on 684, you can see it's like the city on a hill. You know, you see these pyramids that are up on top of this hill as you drive on 684. That's the campus. It's it's kind of isolated on this hilltop, which is kind of why they have this helicopter pad, which they will actually keep with the proposal. Here's an aerial uh, photo of the site. Um, it has a it's this it's this complex that's here. It has a road that goes around it. Um, it has three access points. Um, the main one is to Route 100, uh, just south of the Elephant Hotel here in um, Somers, downtown Hamlet. It also makes a connection to Route 138, just across from the uh, uh, Kennedy Catholic High School complex. And then it also connects to Route 116 here in the, the Purdy section of town, which heads out to 684 and the Purdy's train station. It's a 723-acre site. It's uh, all zoned office business uh, OB 100 uh, and the idea is to develop it as a for-profit private school of uh, grades 9 through 12 where the academic programming is focused on what they call st the STEM uh, curriculum so it's things like you know um, bioscience and biotechnology biomechanical engineering computer science information technology artificial intelligence Robotics, aerospace studies, nanoscience, and manufacturing technology. Uh, they believe that um, the student enrollment could be as high as uh, 1,800 uh, students uh, phased in to that amount at, uh, by 2022. It's an expensive um, private school. It will be uh, $49,000 to go there as a boarding student per year. A uh, commuter student would only have to pay 37000 so they're thinking that most of the students would be boarding students. Uh, it would employ 235 people, 102 teachers, 23 administrators, and a support uh, staff of 110, including everything from administrative assistants to shuttle bus drivers, cafeteria workers, etc. cetera. Uh, for, this is just a, a conceptual plan, but um, basically I, the idea is they want to keep the new um, school kind of within the existing footprint of what's there. So this is what's there. The, um, the uh, brown squares are parking areas. Uh, so you can see that they want to take a lot of the parking areas and just build on those areas because they won't need as much parking for the school. So some of the parking areas would be converted to playing fields. In some places, uh, buildings would be built, um, you know, like these are new, new dormitories. Um, most of the office buildings would just be retained as either uh, academic buildings or, or dormitories. Uh, so to, to take a look at the package of, of uh, approvals they would need, the first is a comprehensive plan amendment, the Somers Comprehensive Plan that never contemplated uh, an academic uh, use on this site. It was always looked at as an um, office site. Uh, they would need to make a uh, zoning text amendment um, to add private for-profit uh, institutions of secondary learning as a special exception use permit in the OB 100 district. Um, also, they want to tinker with the principal uses that are allowed in the district. Um, basically, uh, the office district allows um, uh, houses on two-acre lots, single-family houses. It also allows uh, religious uses, um, they want to just reduce that just to the single family dwellings and I'm going get, to get to that in a, in a minute. So it would be a two acre or 80,000 square foot lot um, that would be required for a single family house. Uh, then is this zone in other parts of the village? Uh -huh. uh, no, no, this is the only site that is zoned OB 100. And so why are they keeping single family houses? Oh, uh, I'm going to get to that. <laughs> the key lies here with this subdivision approval that they would like to receive uh, in addition to the site plan and special use permit. And you can see right here 
that the red line is the subdivision line here where they want to subdivide the school campus out to just keep it here. Uh, then they would subdivide another parcel. This is the on-site sewage treatment plant that is located on the site. And the rest would be subdivided off as the development lot is what they call it, which is uh, 453 acres. So looking at what you know, is allowed in that district, one can imagine that the idea would be to put single family houses on two acre lots um, using the balance of this 453 acre site. Does the treatment plant have capacity? Uh, we'll find out when they do the EIS, I'm sure. Um, they didn't discuss, I mean, this was a real thin packet that they gave us, so. Um, so basically the timeline for the response is, uh, at this point, I mean, there's a couple ways we could do it. We could just send back the form that says no objection to the agency and wait for the next phase of review. Or if you would like me to draft a letter that has some preliminary comments, I can do that. Uh, whatever, whatever you'd like, let me know. And uh, we have, well, we have to send them something by November 13th. Under our crazy referral system, what do they have to send us in the future? Well, they would have to send us the, f uh, the full EIS. I mean, I would imagine they're probably going to do an EIS on this. So they would, I mean, it's not one of the ones where they, they it's optional whether they send us the information or not? R well, this is, a, this comes under site plan. Um, so they would have, it's a 30 day full application because it's abuts three state roads. So they would have to um, use this GML to refer it. The general municipal law, which requires a 30 day notification with complete application. I don't, I don't know if we have enough information at this point to make uh, substantive comments, assuming we're going to be getting the full package in the future. Okay. Anyone else have any feeling about that? I just wonder what the impact was going to be since there's um, a high rate of senior housing in the area. And I know, is, is that close to the IBM? So this is the this IBM. Is the IBM. Yeah, yeah, this is it. Well, the one thing, though, this is the, the buildings are historic in Westchester County. I am Pei, who's the architect. They're very interesting, yeah. And uh, that's one thing I think we need to insist that there be no changes. Now, on the interior, I don't know if there are interiors that are part of the, would be part of an historic designation or not. Certainly the exterior is historic. Right. They did make a statement that said they want to keep the exteriors uh, intact, but they're going to have to do big modifications. I'm sure that, you know. but the question is, are there some lobbies or atriums or things like that that are part of the design that should be kept and not be re on, on the interiors. That's, I mean, I think that's something we need to see in, in the future. Um, I mean, maybe that is that something we sh may want to put in the letter, just to be sensitive to the historic nature of the, of the buildings, uh, as yeah. w interior as well as exterior. Yeah, is that something yeah. that that would be? Okay, so I can just send a short letter that says no objection to lead agency, and I'll make one comment about. Um, the historic uh, nature of the buildings. Sounds okay. Is everyone okay with that? Yeah. Okay, okay. and I'll, I'll circulate that around as well. Okay. okay, thank you, Lucas. Matters for board action. Several items up for action. All right. Good morning. Um, a developer, uh, you have some materials in your uh, mailing uh, describing how a developer has expressed interest in the purchase of eight parcels with a combined acreage of 0.7 acres uh, of property uh, located in the City Way Plains. Um, and it's owned by Westchester County and it's currently identified as a portion of a paper street extension of Beach Street in the City of White Plains. Just to give you an idea about the location, this is I-287 going, if you're driving westbound, uh, there's an exit to get on the central Westchester Parkway going up towards North White Plains. This is uh, properties that are tucked in behind the sound barriers as you're traveling off that exit ramp to get onto the central Westchester Parkway. <coughs> this portion of that parkway is, is state DOT. It's not a county road. The parkway just to the north of it begins to, begins to be 
uh, a county road, Central Westchester Parkway, but this is an area that's been improved by uh, for 287 and the sound barriers. The property's tucked behind these sound barriers here. That's North Broadway at the top, right? Uh, that might be, is that correct? Yeah. Oh, actually, the, the, the stop and shop. That's, the other that's right. right. That's the set. That's the, if you're coming down south on the Central Oyster Parkway, you're zooming across here to get on eastbound 287. Mm -hmm. So again, there's, there's, I'm sorry, this bridge you see in the distance in that photo. And then I think this is Grant Street, right, Kevin? That's Orchard Bridge. Okay, and then. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, that's Grant, right. Grant, that's Grant. and then yeah. uh, Cottage, I think it's called up here. So. Again, County Road to the north, and again, the, the properties here, we're, I'll get into that. The property was purchased uh, by Westchester County in 1926 for the Terrytown White Plains Parkway, which was only partially built, uh, as Kevin could probably give us a little history lesson on that, but it was all gobbled up by I-287 back in the 60s. Um, the parcels consist of a, um, uh, they basically part of the paper street of Beach Street, which currently is over here, kind of curls up here. This is called Henry Place, and this is North North Kensico Avenue in White Plains. Uh, uh, residential properties here on North Kensico, and a couple of houses here. Vacant parcels here. I'll show you how the properties are kind of situated. And the subject parcels make up part of the paper street of Beach Street here. County owns these eight parcels here make up that little strip. It's a 30 foot wide strip. City of White Plains owns pieces of the, that right of way here, the, part, the paper street, privately owned here. The developer owns about five lots here, and he's trying to assemble a variety of parcels to make the development of these uh, this property here uh, feasible. So, um, also, uh, there was a, uh, a deed search done, and the parcels are uh, have never been used for, uh, were never used for the construction of the parkway or for any other county purpose. The parcels are not needed for any other county purpose now or in the future, is what we were determining. Um, and the deeds in connection with the purchase of those parcels did not contain any deed restrictions requiring that these parcels be used for uh, only for park or parkway purposes, which sometimes is what's tagged on to some of these things when they're purchased for parkway purposes, but these did not contain that. And um, again, it's just they're basically making up a, a piece of that Beach Street uh, extension. So um, enclosed in your packet, you'll find a draft resolution in support of the declaration of these parcels, these eight parcels which make up that Beach Street section there, as residual parcels and that they're no longer needed for any county purpose and that they be disposed of by the county pursuant to section 209.101 of the county administrative code. Um, and are there any questions on that? They'll be sold. Yeah, sold. They'll be sold. That's why they can't give after them this to is the city. So mean, this otherwise you could have given them to the city of White Plains, but we actually can realize some dollars from right. the city. Yeah, we usually have to offer the right of first refusal to the local municipality for municipal purposes or park. Right, and I forgot to mention too that you see below here is another county-owned parcel, residual parcel I, that this board designated that in an effort to dispose of county properties, all these little residual parcels dealing with other old parkways. Uh, this board deemed that as residual parcel some years ago, about 10, 10, 12 years ago. So that sits as also a residual parcel, um, and now we're tacking on this as uh, also to be residual for disposal by the county. So the next step, this is the first step, is that the county would determine this as, as residual, not not needed for any county purpose. Again, and then and then um, the city, the, the county would negotiate with the property owner eventually for sale of the parcels. So there would be an RFP for the sale, or is it just a straight transaction? My understanding is that if this property owner is approaching the county, that it would just be negotiating with this one property owner. Okay. How how? Does this connect to a street? Obviously, up here. here. So this is this is the street. So yeah, but it does, this I don't has see front of a street. So theoretically, he would he would pull a driveway down here on this paper street, and yeah, he's, but he's going to have to purchase property from the city white plains as well, uh, and theoretically maybe even this other property owner here uh, to get into here. Or, and if it's a driveway, maybe it's this is 30 feet. He could pull a driveway into here to 
get access into this property. Um, so well, that's his access. The county parcel has no frontage on Beach Street West, correct? This, this one doesn't. No. This one does. This, this, if the Where? the right of way touches Beach Street, it doesn't it, it, it. Yeah, on the corner, but that's not enough for uh, uh, a. Uh, you're saying the paved portion, portion not the full right of way. Right. That cave where it says Beach Street, that's the paved portion of the street, not the right of way. Right. If you were to look closely. So uh, if you develop the street using the full right of way, you can make a street. So there would be, a, with the city piece and the county piece, a part of both there's the enough of a connection to Beach Street West to create a driveway coming off of that? Well, it would be a full city street. You'd have 50 feet of right of way, and you could put a 25 or 30 foot wide street, extend Beach Street instead of going up the corner there, just extend it straight down. What's the city's opinion on this? Again, the, the real estate director's uh, right now just talking with the uh, I mean, it, does, it doesn't work without this without it the city work piece. And, and he's got legwork to do. He or they have legwork to do. Uh, negotiating also with the city for the purchase of the city parcels. Um, and again, the first step is just us saying that no county purpose for this. Um, it's the county's policy that we'd like to dispose of these properties and get rid of them off uh, because there's no no county mm -hmm. use for this. This so. has been lingering around for a while. I represented the uh, owner of the vacant property ten years ago, so this has been up there. Yeah. They were originally going to try to develop those parcels yeah. in orange and use the uh, city's right of way as a private driveway. Any so idea how many houses that are There's planned? Five lots there. Yeah. Five yeah. lots, and what is the city's uh, policy on affordable housing? I know it's a. I believe it's a ten percent. Uh, and it goes to. Aside. And it goes to a five lot subdivision. And I don't know if it goes to five. If it's that few uh, units, though. But going back to Norma, doesn't it have to be offered to the city of White Plains first, yeah. right of first refusal? Right. And the houses that were depicted in the in the aerial shot, those don't look like anything that was built after like 1980. Those look like those houses were. Have been there for a while. They were there for a while, and right now though, that area, that parcel, is pretty much another barrier to. I mean. Those people are not going to be happy to suddenly have houses in their backyard no. when they've had woods in a wall. So, and, and that wall does it put the aerial up again, please? The maintaining of that wall does that still uh, become uh, it's the state DOT? Wooden? It's interesting that the houses have not encroached into the area in terms of usable. Yard. I know. I know of other places where, you know, they've extended their backyards in, into uh, county property. It's hard to tell from that. Though. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, to you do. have to do so. I'm not sure that's. Well, it looks like the back of the. Well, I don't know what. What are, are those? They're not garages. What are those rear buildings? That white roof right, building right. and the other building. It's back here. Yeah. Back here. What are those? Probably garages. Yeah, but I don't see a driveway going to them. How long will the shed? Yeah, right. This is like a back patio kind of thing. Yeah. Like this might be a garage shed. in the back. Yeah. Maybe she sheds. Uh, maybe she <laughs> sheds. Converted <laughs> <laughs> garage. That came up in all your good. Okay. What's the feeling of this board in terms of uh, calling this excess property? I guess it doesn't have any use for the county. Right. No. But um, should the, the county, county should be talking to the city? What is their feeling about a development back there? Do they want to facilitate it or not? I mean, basically, we got to offer the part. We got, I presume, there's an appraisal, and it gets offered right. to the city first. And uh, if they wanted to stop development, they could. I guess you can't get in there without the access to it. It just so really knowing what the city would think of there would make a difference, I would think. But this is what starts the process. Yeah. If, right. the, if the county has a need for the property, then it doesn't go, there's no reason to have any discussion. Well, so the first step in the process is to really have a discussion about whether yeah. there is really any county purpose. Okay. Our, clearly, our, our recommendation is there is no need right. for right. it. Clearly there's no there need. There's a legal dumping, we can't even see it. Right. You know, so right. Clearly there's no need for it. It's a liability. I think but so. I think 
as Dwight said, I think maybe we want to talk to the city and see, you know, we, we can start the process, but right. if, maybe, the county should talk maybe you can report back to us in mm -hmm. terms of, yeah, we okay, we've back. started the process, what's the city's point of view on this? And I keep an eye on the affordable housing requirements, what, what uh, this White Plains Code requires. Okay, so we have a resolution declaring that this is excess property of which there is no need for the county and uh, that it should be disposed of according to county procedures. I make a motion. Joe makes a motion. Second. Second. Second, Second Peter. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. So your next action. Um, the county executive will be submitting legislation for a capital budget amendment to create a new capital project called BPL 32, Yonkers Waterfront Plan Phase 2. There's an existing project called Yonkers Waterfront Plan. This is now a new project called Phase 2. I'll get into the details of what this project is uh, going to entail. Um, here's a map. It's kind of hard to see at this scale, but downtown Yonkers below, City Hall, Yonkers Pier, uh, and the waterfront being, much of it being developed as you go north from downtown Yonkers and the pier along the waterfront and to the top you'll see Trevor, uh, Trevor Park, JFK Marina uh, along the water there, uh, the Glenwood train station uh, is at the bottom left of the screen there and again uh, Hudson, River, Hudson River Museum here uh, in, within Trevor Park, other things in the neighborhood, Riverside, Riverside High School is right there adjacent to the Hudson River Museum and PS25, the museum school. And here is Warburton Avenue. Um, as part of that previous project, uh, Yonkers Waterfront Plan, the county partnered with the city to develop a, um, an amphitheater at, the, at Trevor Park, right adjacent to, good morning, uh, adjacent to the Hudson River Museum. And you kind of see that here, and it's operational outdoor concerts and performances there at Trevor Park adjacent to the Hudson River Museum. Um, now funds are requested in this new project for an amount of $6.2 million for improvements to the Hudson River Museum. I'll get into some of those details. Uh, as you probably all know, Hudson River Museum serves residents from across Westchester County and the region. It is home to the county's only planetarium and provides many, many residents their first experience. No, no, no. I'm sorry? The Portchester Middle School has a planetarium. Has a planetarium, okay. So I, the materials <laughs> I got from the city, and I was told that it's the only planetarium. Let's call it. Irish and High School, too. They yeah, actually. Irish and High School, too. The county's biggest planetarium. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the city's. Good the marketing. City. You did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and what, what Norman and I found out, too, when we took a tour of the facility is that they're on their third set of equipment in that planetarium, the big piece of equipment that shows all the stars. They they, they, that, they're on the, the third version of that. So, uh, but one of the problems is with the, the planetarium has a leaky roof and there's other leaky roofs. <laughs> yes. like, so we'll get to that. Um, so it has the biggest uh, planetarium <laughs> uh, and provides many residents with their first experience with fine art, astronomy, and history of the lower Hudson Valley. Um, just to give you, here's another slide. So. Uh, the new project and a substantial part of the county funds it includes an expansion of the museum's west wing, which you kind of see here in the foreground facing the Hudson River. It, it's an 11,000 square foot, three story, one story, two story, three stories. It looks like two stories, but it's really three stories. Expansion of the, of the museum, uh, 11,000 square feet total, just over 3,000 square feet per floor. Um, and the uh, expansion will include Gal new gallery space on the top floor, s much needed storage space on the middle floor, again over 3,000 square feet, and a new 100 seat theater on the bottom floor. And we, we got some really nice slides. Here's another view, if you were imagining looking from the river. Here's the existing planetarium dome. There's the existing um, amphitheater. This is the site of the West Wing addition, 11,000 square foot West Wing addition. It's hard to see there, but uh, footprint there. This is the planetarium dome over here, and there again, about just over 3,000 square feet per floor, addition to the uh, museum there. Uh, beautiful new gallery space and some of the renderings. Uh, view of the Palisades across the river. That's that's generally the location of an existing balcony. That if you've ever been there, and we'll show you a photo of that. More gallery space, 
hundred seat theater in the bottom floor there to be used for programs and lectures and classes. Uh, kind of very hard to see here, but that's the existing um, courtyard. Uh, Glenview Historic Home on the right, that's part of the museum as well. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that. Um, Amaya Lynn uh, display there in the yard, it's hard to see with the sticks. But the, there, see there's an open breezeway from the courtyard out to the, to the view of the Hudson River, that's going to be closed. That's standing on the balcony around which the, the West Wing expansion will be built. So that balcony So will yeah, be this is the current balcony that's out there. You see the uh, condition of uh, it. Yeah, and, and oddly enough, I won't go too far into it. See that the ground, the crack in the concrete is silver in color. That is a Maya Lin art uh, installation. So she turned cracks in yeah. the concrete <laughs> as into a temporary art installation. And, uh, and I stepped on it, and I said, oh my gosh. She said, no, it's meant to be stepped on and trod upon. So, <laughs> and uh, so, uh, it, again, doesn't look much different from the existing courtyard, but that breezeway will be enclosed. And uh, again, beyond, this is, this, these are existing walls. The, extent, the, the extension is beyond wet to the west there. Uh, so, but you won't have to walk outside, and it becomes a problem with shoveling snow and people, things like that. So again, we're back to the, to the uh, view of the existing museum. Um, also, just as background, the museum was built without storage back in the 60s, which is a major problem. It limits the use of the museum's galleries. It's hard to move things around. It's hard to put things in storage. And it, uh, the museum right now, particularly the storage, doesn't provide for proper environmental conditions uh, to protect the museum's collections. And again, we're going to get into some of the leaks and things like that, which is a major problem for the museum. Uh, this lack of storage uh, jeopardizes the museum's valuable accreditation by the American Association of Museums and as well as their ability to apply for funding and have uh, kind of hot, you know, unique installations and lending to the museum because people who are lending to the museum don't want to lend it if they have issues with the environment and leaks and storage. Um, the project, the $6.2 million, uh, in addition to that West Wing, um, there were also, uh, so also to be paying for um, renovations to the existing museum and the planetarium built back in the 60s, including roof repairs. Hard to see, but uh, imagine a flat concrete roof built in the 60s. You've got leaking here. You can see the white uh, residue there looking up at the ceiling. These are just a couple of locations there throughout the building. Uh, a beautiful dry sunny day with a wet floor. We were shown a couple spots of those. Don't have any pictures inside the, the um, planetarium room. But that dome building, you can see on the exterior cracks, and they have issues with leaking into that planetarium. Um, part of the project is also renovations to the historic uh, Glenview home, which you see at the north side of the uh, property here in the museum. Um, and uh, Glenview is a 19th century Gilded Age home. It's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It's experienced serious deterioration over the past 20 years inside and out, creating public health and safety risks. Proposed improvements include roof repairs, repairs and replacements of mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems, building exterior, masonry, windows and doors, and fire safety improvements throughout the building. And here's the beautiful Glen view, and it really has this unique stone facade quarried nearby in Hastings, we were told. Um, architect, uh, many of you know Steve Tilley's on the case. He's been identifying all the needed improvements on the historic elements, but the city's also has uh, estimates of all the life, uh, health and safety repairs and the systems repairs throughout the building. What was the first line? Go back one quick. This one? Is that part of Maya Lynn's? Yes, it's, wow. I forget yeah, what it's so called, but it's, it's something to do with something rivers. Something to do with the river, right. And so inside they have this beautiful wall of the Hudson River from, you know, Albany in the mountains, all the way down with little pins. She installed that. She installed this out in the courtyard, and then that, hmm. that painted uh, silver looks like rivers on the deteriorating concrete. So, uh, and it's to summarize the funding. Uh, the total project costs twelve million dollars, six million, six point two million dollars from Westchester County, five point four from the City of Yonkers. It got secured some New York State funds, six hundred thirty thousand dollars. Uh, the use of that $6.2 million is the bottom table. Uh, so most substantial of the county funds would be over $4 million for that West Wing expansion, uh, almost a million dollars for improvements to the 1969 uh, building repair and improvements, and 
just over a million dollars for restoration and improvements to uh, Glenview Historic Home. And the um, your materials, um, you'll see a, pl a draft planning board resolution and a planning board report, which uh, the report outlines this project and the, the recommendation uh, that the planning board would be given uh, for the project. Uh, they both give support for the capital budget amendment um, for you to consider. Uh, and the, they both note that the project is consistent with Westchester 2025 and that it will help support and protect a regional cultural resource, protect an historic property listed on the National Register, and it will help in the revitalization of the Yonkers waterfront and downtown. And again, yeah, this the is other thing is this also complements a couple other capital projects. Anthony, you're doing the sidewalks. There's a ribbon walk connection from the train station through JFK Marina Park up this street, which is J. What is the name? I think it's called JFK Boulevard. Okay. I think. Yeah. Up on Warburton in front of the museum, and then connects on a side street to the old Croton Aqueduct. It is the ribbon walk connection through the section of Yonkers. So, uh, kind of, we've had other capital projects associated with the waterfront over the years. I mean, this is decades, it's a decades old problem, a uh, problem, it's a decades old project. Uh, well, we run into problems when these projects are kind of, as Peter knows, you've got these ongoing projects. This is a clean new project, the first piece of which is now funding for the Hudson River Museum, this project, it kind of helps keep it simple and clean. So. And the accreditation is due 2020, I believe. Right, so so they're, they're, they've got it. That's why it's really critical time. It's very. This is very time sensitive because they have to have that storage built and available for when the accreditation is due in, in 2020. Right. And uh, so when they have a new uh, installation or collection, you know, a new display, or, um, there's no swing space. They have to close a whole floor of the museum for. I don't know, a week or two weeks or whatever, how long it is, and then install it. Things are shoved in storage rooms and things. It's, it just doesn't work very well for them. Again, all parts of the, uh, the uh, newly accreditation, like when they get their accreditation, they look at all that too. So I think the, the environmental constraints, is, the environmental problems in the building is a big problem for them with the accreditation. Does, does it have to be completely built by 2020? Or just things in place for it to be built by 2020 for the accreditation? I believe it's they have to have the approvals, okay. the land use approvals, everything in place, okay, to sh really demonstrate that there, the space is going to be available. Right. Okay. That, and that West Wing won't be constructed, you know, no, I didn't think by, that. if it's already uh, almost 2019 now, yeah. so. Okay, we have a resolution. Make a motion. <coughs> Michael, make a motion. Second. Second. Toy, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes. <coughs> all right. Um, got our next item for action I is uh, I misplaced the pang off my server. Describe this one. This. Do you have a good morning? Give me a copy. This is an amendment to the 2018 capital budget. It is to add four thousand four million dollars to the existing project. The project was first appropriated had first appropriated funds in twenty twelve of one point six eight million dollars. And the first bonding for the project was in twenty thirteen to start the design. It's now a number of years later, and you can see here the location of it. Um, of note is it's below the split with the uh, National Register portion of the Bronxville Parkway. And it it's at the border of Yonkers, uh, Bronxville, Mount Vernon. It's very close to Scout Field. It's actually a viaduct. It does not go over water. This is one piece of the connection between Yonkers and the other side of the river. Uh, this portion only goes over the Bronxville Parkway, so it does not go over water at all. It's about 70 feet long, 50 feet wide. Um, since the project was first identified and put into the capital budget in 2018, in 2012, sorry, uh, there has been more significant deterioration of the concrete, which is the reason why an additional $2 million of county funds is being requested. Of course, there's been inflation rising over the past number of years, as well as uh, exacerbated deterioration of the concrete. 
In addition, there's a $2 million portion that will come from non-county shares from Con Edison. Uh, there is a gas transmission line that's embedded in the grid, and that will be removed and upgraded by Con Edison. It will be paid for by Con Edison as non-county shares. So although it's shown as part of the capital budget amendment, it will not be paid for by the county. Uh, if you have any more detailed questions, uh, we do have Kevin Roseman of DPW who has far more knowledge about the project than I do, and he'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Is it going to have to be closed during construction? Um, no. Um, we're going to maintain uh, traffic on the bridge above. Um, the center pier is going to be completely replaced. The original capital project only talked about the cap beam, the top above this column. Uh, as you can see by this photo, the columns have deteriorated. The um, columns will be replaced. Um, the the uh, temporary shoring towers will be installed. Um, traffic will be shifted on the Bronx River Parkway to the outside. Uh, we'll still be able to maintain three lanes during peak hour in each direction on the Bronx River Parkway, and we'll be able to maintain traffic above. Um, uh, we just have to jack the bridge, uh, you know, millimeters to take the load off the existing pier, put in the temporary shoring towers, then demolish the pier, install the new pier. Um, the reason for the Con Edison work was um, normally when you jack a bridge, the little bit we need to, um, existing utilities can stay. But Con Edison determined that this gas main was in such a um, state that they don't want us to jack it. Um, so they're going to, um, we're going to, uh, there's going to be a temporary gas main installed um, before we jack the bridge, um, so we can uh, do the work, and then the new gas main will be installed. Um, and then it will move the activator until after we uh, put the bridge back on the newly constructed set up here. And there's other repairs to the abutments and the bridge joints. Where does the two million non-county share come from? Con Edison. Uh, Con Edison. All from Con Edison? Yes. And the additional that covers their cast main work. It doesn't help us. It's just it covers their, it's their work. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Have we had any safety issues with this? Uh, um, well, we did, re you know, we have uh, safety flags um, that have been issued as part of periodic bridge inspection. We've had to chip some of the concrete away um, so it doesn't fall into the roadway. So there have been, uh, you know, safety, um, no, no, you know, no incidents, flags. but there are definitely concerns. And uh, the bridge would only further deteriorate if uh, these things are not addressed. When the original capital project was conceived, the paint was in good condition. As you see by this photo, um, we, uh, we now also need to do some uh, painting, bridge uh, steel repairs, and that uh, increases costs uh, significantly because you have to do like paint abatement um, and uh, also um, additional maintenance protection of traffic costs. Um, you know, roadway will be reduced in uh, travel lanes during all peak hours um, to accommodate the work. Hopefully, when all of the current crises in capital budgeting uh, projects get dealt with, maybe we'll get to a real five-year plan and we'll get to projects like this before get they get to look like this. Uh, I know now it's just been catch-up in terms of trying to catch up to things that are the most serious problems, but, you know, under a normal capital project, this would have been on schedule from years ago to be taken care of before it got to this that, state. That point, it's a very excellent point to make. And the capital work group, the comprehensive of the capital projects committee, we have been working for the past couple of months on working for new capital uh, capital projects that will address exactly that. It will be a an asset management program where the cap where DPW hopefully with the planning department, the planning board, will be reviewing pro potential projects, prioritizing them, and putting them into a correct five-year program. Right now, as you, as you noted, we'll be, we are going to be playing catch-up for the next four years. And then in the fifth year of the capital, the next five-year program, we hope to introduce the newest projects. Okay. I have one question. Yeah. Just for clarification, it's the, the capital project is $4 million approximately, Insight, or $6 million? It was $1.63 million originally, originally, adding $4 million. So it's 5.63, but only uh, 3.63 is county share. The other 2 million is not county share. And if I could point out that uh, you did have a mailing of a draft planning board report and planning board resolution. Uh, there was a typo in the 
resolution referring to the PL2. The PL2 is correct, but the identification of the PL2 is incorrect. It has been updated and it's in your day of meeting packet. This is the updated one? Okay, can I have a motion? I guess we can't uh, ignore this problem. Amanda, second. Joe, all in favor? Opposed? All right, so your last action this morning is that you actually have to adopt your calendar for next year. So um, if there are any changes, now would be the time to recommend them. Otherwise, if you don't mind, I, I'm looking for a motion to have you approve and adopt your calendar for 2019. Having the Wednesday after election night is uh, not the best, but 2019 is not a major uh, election year. No. Board of Legislators. Board of Legislators. Anyone have a problem getting up this morning? <laughs> <laughs> any, anyone have any other problems? I checked some of the uh, Jewish holidays. I didn't see any issues. So I'll move it. Dwight, second. Second. Bernie, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Okay. Okay, last on our agenda is a presentation by the New York City Department of Planning on, on the geography of jobs. Yes, so we actually have a guest, the Director of Regional Planning for New York City, Carolyn Grossman Meager, is here with us. Um, and so we're, uh, we'll let you take us through your report. Is this a place for me to it is. You, can, you can stand. I can, if you want to sit and, and forward the slides yourself. No more action. Yeah, yeah. I think that's fine. If everyone can see me yeah, from there, it's not too we'll be focusing on the, on the projector. So that's fine. That? Copies sure. to hand out to the commissioners. Um, so thank you all for having me here, and thank you, Norma and Bill, for for uh, for the wonderful invitation. Um, uh, I, you're both right. I am the director of regional planning within the city planning department uh, of New York City. Uh, and I, I should say, it's a pleasure to see other planning commissions uh, in work, being mostly uh, 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 in our own world, and, and obviously much, much similarities between our planning commission hearings uh, and, and, and yours. Um, so uh, I guess just a, just a couple of pieces of background. Um, New York City's planning commission and planning department obviously have a very robust agenda. Uh, a lot of things going on in the city right now related both to private applications in front of us, city actions, citywide actions, uh, 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 specific actions related to housing and economic development and resiliency, uh, neighborhood-wide actions related to neighborhood transformation, capital planning uh, issues related to integration of growth areas uh, and, and city investments, uh, a whole platform on the census. So we're a very, very busy department. Um, but my division was created about three years ago now uh, as one of the recommendations in our citywide strategic plan, 1NYC, uh, because the city had started to realize that with all of this going on and with all of the initiatives happening within the city, our relationship to the region uh, really affects our ability to, recognize, to, to realize all of the ambitions of the city's future growth, prosperity, sustainability, resiliency, et cetera. That has always, of course, been the case, uh, but I think there's a newfound appreciation uh, within the city, uh, given the struggles that the city is going through, uh, and a newfound commitment to reaching out and adding capacity to our relationships with the rest of the region, which is something that we really haven't done historically. Um, my office was created really as part of the commitment to making that an ongoing capacity and mandate of our planning commission to look outside of our borders and to work with others. And you know, we've been, we really have approached that with a sense of humility and un trying to understand where New York City uh, can make a difference within the region. Um, and, and we've been doing it through uh, you know, a series of, of, of different moves. I'd say for today's purposes, the biggest really are going around the region and talking to others and making sure that we understand each other's planning initiatives, where they connect, where we have common purpose, and investing a lot in data capacity uh, to look at the region, which really we hadn't done. We have a lot of dedicated uh, uh, capacity within the city looking at our growth trends, but we hadn't widened the lens 
we found it to be a very valuable exercise uh, and we believe it's, it's valuable for us to be sharing that as well. And so what you're going to see today is one of the first publications that we've put out, uh, the Geography of Jobs Report, which you now have a copy of. It's the first economic report that New York City has done looking at the region's economy and not just at our own economy. Um, and we've, uh, we continue, this, is, this is a pattern that we expect to continue, where we're looking at our housing, our employment, all of our growth trends in, in, in more of that regional lens and making sure that we're sharing that with all of you and that we're using it to inform our own planning better. So specific to the geography of jobs, this is a report that was issued uh, uh, earlier this summer. As I said, the first economic report uh, uh, looking at the region's changing employment geography. Uh, we released it uh, with the New York Building Congress and about 70 other tri-state uh, government, nonprofits, and business stakeholders. Uh, Westchester County was uh, kind enough to, to join us uh, at that release. Um, and it really started, I think, a, a good dialogue about what's happening to the region's economy, how we can work together to think about economic opportunities for the region and our, our, our economic standing relative to other regions, particularly nationally as well as globally, how that relates to our housing and workforce needs for the region, um, and how we, how we can continue to look at all of these and work effectively over time. So I'm going to walk through some of the data just to start and, 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 and look at a uh, baseline of what, what do we mean when we say the region. We're typically looking at 31 counties, which is a definition that the Regional Plan Association invented uh, back in 1929 when they did a first regional plan looking at the uh, New York City and its surrounds. It's a definition that's based on New York City's City Hall, about 75 miles in every direction from, uh, from <coughs> except for the ocean, uh, and we think is a pretty good approximation of our, our uh, commuter shed, our employment shed, uh, et cetera. Uh, this is a region that has about 23 million people in it today. New York City is about 37%. So we say we're obviously by far the largest municipality, but we're outnumbered by people living outside of the city uh, and, are, and around us in approximately 900 municipalities. Westchester, of course, is about a million here. It's about 4% of the total uh, regional population. And I should point out, for all of the statistics I'm going to go through, in your booklets you also have a, a just a, a fast fact sheet where we've broken out Westchester relative to the region in case that's of interest to follow. Um, so we're looking at 23 million people. We're looking at about 9 million households. Uh, I love this map because it breaks down renter and owner occupied and you can see those geographic patterns that are that are that were created you know, over our 100 year history uh, very clearly. A lot of rental housing concentrated in New York City and inner New Jersey and in all of the older suburban downtowns along the rail lines. You can really see that geography uh, uh, hugging closely. Um, and we're a region of about 9 million jobs. And I also love this map because if you didn't know where New York City was, you wouldn't see it here. Uh, it's a regional economy. It's an economy that stretches along our highways and rail system. Uh, it, it, it's centralized, but it's not hyper-centralized. New York City, again, has about 40% of total total regional jobs. We have about 50% of the regional GDP in the city, which means we've got about 50% of the regional GDP outside the city. And obviously, again, Westchester, about 4% of this total pie, uh, the total regional pie. And it's, and it's an economy that's very diverse, right? I think this is breaking it down into very high-level sectors, sort of office-based, institutional-based, industrial-owned retail uh, type jobs. And you can see certain patterns. You can see the airports show up. You can see the New Jersey parkways show up in purple. You can see Manhattan. You can see some of the uh, suburban uh, office parks showing up in blue. But it's a, it's a real mismatch. We have a lot of jobs uh, locating in a, in, a, in a very diverse range of locations inside, outside the city, urban and suburban contexts. Um, and one thing I also like to say is, you know, a hundred years ago, New York City, you know, was the region here. We, we were about 90% of the total population uh, uh, in city before, before suburban trends, right? So the, 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 the pattern here of suburbanization and, and, and government formation um, you know, is still a fairly new one you know, in, in history. It's something, uh, the, the period that we're going through now uh, where, where we have the, the majority of growth occurring in the center, 
but a, a, a wide, wide array of, of municipal governances is still still relatively in its infancy in the creation of this uh, uh, this regional system. So some of the flows, obviously there's huge flows in an ecosystem that we're, that we're, we're looking at. Some of the key indicators we're looking at, migration patterns historically, New York City has been sort of a pump for the whole region. Uh, we, we are net ex importers of people from all around the world and all around the country, but net exporters of people to our own region, sort of been the historical picture. Uh, so today there's on average about 95,000 people a year leaving New York City for somewhere else in our region and about 60,000 coming back in. So net loss of 35,000 people a year to a region that's about one in four people leaving New York City, staying in our you know, proverbial backyard. Um, and a big piece of that is obviously the flow with Westchester, where it's about two to one leaving for Westchester, coming back. Um, but you know, bit significant flows here, and of course, that ability to live outside of the city uh, and work inside of the city, stay close and be connected to the city, or vice versa, informs our commuter flows. Um, so most people in our region live and work in the areas that they they live and work in the same areas, right? That's true in Westchester as well. But in total, we end up with very, very large flows in and out of the city. So about a million people coming to New York City every day from outside of our borders, and about 300,000 leaving the city, uh, which is a smaller piece of our workforce, but a, a significant piece of Westchester's workforce. So to break that down just for the Westchester piece, about 135,000 people every day into the city, and about 60,000 coming out. And in terms of people going in, it's obviously concentrated in Manhattan, but it's increasing to other boroughs, as uh, you'll see from some of the trends we talk about. Uh, and uh, in the 60,000, it's about two thirds coming from the Bronx and a third coming from the rest of the, the rest of the city. So when I talk about New York City and concentrating growth, what do I mean? Um, well, if you've been to the city recently, uh, you've probably seen it and experienced it. The city is experiencing a, a growth uh, a growth spurt that is comparable to what we were experiencing 100 years ago uh, before, before World War II. Um, a lot of people, almost half a million people, uh, incre uh, our population increased by since 2010, uh, about 165,000 housing permits, and almost 700,000 jobs in the city, right? So really, the spurt is being driven by the economy and a real explosion of, of employment within the city that uh, is, in, is still concentrated in Manhattan, but uh, the, but faster growing in our outer boroughs, which is a really uh, new trend. The growth of Brooklyn, Bronx, and, uh, and, and Queens as employment centers is a very new trend uh, for us. And our housing growth, which has been significant, is obviously not keeping up with, with, with job growth uh, uh, and with, uh, with population growth uh, as well. So as I said, you know, the, 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 the growth here of the outer boroughs uh, is, is new and when we started to look at what was happening in the city and, and, and contextualized it to the regional pattern, what we saw is that unlike in, in the last several economic cycles, where New York City has represented about a third of economic growth for the region, what, we've, what we're seeing in this period is that the vast concentration of employment is happening within New York City. And not just within Manhattan, but within, within those other boroughs. So you know, to walk you through here, North Jersey, which has been about 30% of the region's employment, really growing at, at, at much slower speeds. Long Island, fairly anemic, um, uh, but faster growing. Connecticut, almost flatlined after the recession. Uh, and Hudson Valley, uh, increasingly smaller pieces as well. So what, we, what, what this says to us is something, at least in this last cycle, has dramatically changed the geography of where employment is concentrating. And it's not just the numbers, it's also the composition of what those jobs have meant for our region. Um, what, we, what we've done here is broken down both by geography and those high level sector types. New York City in the post-recession period has basically concentrated most office-based jobs. We've net increased about 155,000, while other sub-regions have net declined in office jobs. And uh, there's more detail on this in your, in your reports, but the basic story is Everyone lost financial jobs in the post-recession period, but New York City has uniquely gained back more professional services and information jobs relative to others. It's, this is on a sub-regional basis, 
So what you of course see is that there's granularity within each subregion. Westchester has hot spots where, where, where office employment is doing well, like White Plains. But on a, on, on a Hudson Valley basis, uh, what we've seen is, is an overall moderate decline. And what we're seeing is where the employment gains are is primarily in education, healthcare, and then retail and service uh, sectors, where New York City is also gaining, but it is being met proportionately uh, by other locations in the region where we have seen employment. What we've also seen is that the region is continuing to lose industrial uh, employment. New York City is not continuing to lose industrial employment. We believe that that's because we've lost most of what we had to lose already. Uh, and wi where we have still had very modest lo losses in things like goods manufacturing, construction increases has offset that. Um, but where we're seeing where there's larger bases, yeah, particularly in, 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 inner New in inner New Jersey, where there's been a very large uh, uh, industrial base historically in pharmaceutical manufacturing and, 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 and lot, we're seeing that uh, things like warehousing and logistics, which are hot there, are not enough to offset the employment losses. Uh, and to lesser extents, we're seeing that as well in the Hudson Valley in Connecticut. Uh, Long Island's about flat on, on industrial. So, you know, what this says, uh, and there's more detail on this in the report as well, I won't belabor it, but obviously the office base is a much larger component of the region's overall GDP uh, uh, and wage output. So uh, the story is in even more increased imbalance uh, in terms of higher wage and higher, uh, higher GDP sectors concentrating in the center, while other areas that have historically been part of that ecosystem are increasingly seeing their employment gains in lower value, uh, locally, servicing, lo locally serving sectors. So if that's the employment side, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the workforce side. Uh, and what we see is that they're mirroring each other, right? Um, the, 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 the workforce of the region is overall growing, but much of that growth is dependent on uh, plus 65 uh, uh, workers staying in the workforce longer. So to isolate the effect of new entrants to the labor force, uh, we look specifically at the 25 to 54 uh, in labor force cohorts. So this is change since 2000 in that young workforce. And what you see is very familiar, uh, to me at least, uh, very, very uh, specific geographies that show up. New York City added about 440,000 young workers in this period. That was more than the region overall. Collectively, the rest of the region netted a decline in young workers. Um, on a sub-regional basis, you can see North Jersey is the only area that increased. That's really being propped up by Jersey City, Hoboken, Newark, New Brunswick, a lot of rail corridor towns, and, uh, and, and, and some smaller rail corridor towns as well. Uh, in, in Westchester, negative four, negative one percent, so relative flat line. Again, you see Yonkers, uh, Mount Vernon, New Rochelle, uh, White Plains as the areas of, of, of increase. Port Chester, I think popping up in the corner there. Um, Connecticut, you know, it's the same story. Rail towns, uh, the, the rail municipalities are the places of increase. Other areas are aging in place and not seeing an increase in that young labor force. Uh, and as on a regional basis, uh, what that means is that most of that young labor force is uh, is really concentrating very, very strongly in the center. Uh, I will mention we have more work looking at this to see how it compares to U.S. trends, and what we're initially seeing is this is a pretty unique condition. Certain places like Boston, East Coast cities uh, that have similarities in terms of land use characteristics and patterns of development have some of this pattern where, it's, where the labor force is very uniquely concentrating in the center city. Uh, it is not a West Coast problem. We're seeing that Los Angeles, it's about split. Um, and that their growth patterns, uh, their distribution of growth, uh, and employment growth uh, really mirrors that. So again, t t just to point out what I was saying before, this is a fairly unique uh, 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 situation in terms of our region's history as well. New York City gained growth primarily in the first part of the, uh, the 20th century. Um, so actually, let me orient you to this slide. On the top here, you have the cumulative growth of our region, getting up to that 23 million that we are today from where we were in 1900. And at the bottom here is the change in population every single decade, just broken between New York City and the rest of the region in, in, in crude terms. 
So what you see here is you know, a familiar pattern for us. New York City gained a lot of population as we were building out in uh, the subway system. We were populating the outer boroughs in the first part of the century. That started to flatline. We declined in population in the 70s. Uh, and, and really, we're just getting our way back to that. In fact, it's about 2006 that we passed our peak population from the 50s. So now we're growing on top of that. Um, this is all of the growth we're having today. Suburban pattern, similar to New York in the first part of the century, commuter rail towns right, grow, grew very fast at the same period. Auto suburbanization happens, really takes over. Uh, but we continue to see suburban growth in exurban areas through the 2000s, right, until we hit the recession uh, where the ability to grow cheap, low density housing at the outskirts of the region really slowed down. So this is the first decade that we've seen in 100 years where New York City is growing more in total than the rest of our region combined. Um, and, and in general, it's a really modest pace of growth, right? Which is appropriate we, for a region of our age and maturity, but is a concern as we think about economic development uh, issues and the ability to continue to replenish a labor force. And the final point I'll make here about the labor force is that the concentrations of growth and where, and where we're seeing them correlate fairly well to where we're seeing housing development. This is a map of building permits in the region post 2010 uh, provided by the US Census Bureau. Um, and what we see here, very similar, New York City growing a, uh, a lot of the housing uh, of the region, surprisingly North Jersey really matching the city. Um, and so what we're seeing is about 90% of the total, total housing is happening basically in, the, in, in this concentrated zone. Uh, areas that had historically been more of the suburban base of New York City, Westchester and Long Island included in that, are seeing less housing development and therefore seeing less migration, less replenishment of that young labor force. And what this has meant in terms of New Jersey in particular, but for all of us, is that the balance of jobs, population and housing are changing within the region. What we've seen is that New York is adding a lot of jobs and adding a lot of housing and people, but our jobs are continuing to outpace our housing growth, which means that as we historically have been, New York City is to grow its economy will continue to be dependent on a regional housing shed, right? We, today we have about 25 to 30% of our workforce uh, coming in from outside of the city, non-resident workforce. We expect that that's going to continue if our, if our economy continues to grow. What we're seeing is that places that had been historic bedroom communities for the city, like Long Island, are actually growing jobs at a great that's gr uh, 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 growing jobs at a rate that's higher than the rate of housing growth. So there's actually more employment moving out towards Long Island, more workers moving out towards Long Island than moving in, uh, sort of rebalancing that trend. Um, that's happening in the Hudson Valley as well. We're seeing, um, sorry, we're, sorry, the opposite of that is happening in Hudson Valley as well. Uh, more housing growth than job growth, so slightly more people coming into the city, but for Westchester it's about a, about a net balance. Um, and in North Jersey, a lot more housing than jobs. We've seen that that's basically the significant concentration of suburban, uh, suburban housing but without much employment growth. And so most of that growth is feeding New York City uh, instead of feeding uh, local economic development. So that's a lot of information that we're looking at. And, and just to say a few things about what we're, what we're doing with it and what we think it means. Well, one thing we think it means for us is that we need to inform our own strategies of economic development with a regional perspective. And I think that uh, uh, one, one real strong example of that for us is thinking about the Penn Access Corridor, uh, uh, which will bring new train service through the East Bronx, add new stations in the East Bronx, and connect it better to Westchester and Connecticut. This is uh, a picture from uh, a public workshop we had just about two weeks ago in one of the, the future station areas for that site. Um, where we're talking about sort of those regional connection points. If you're not as familiar, just to, to, to show you a picture, this is the new line. It'll come down the uh, Amtrak Hellgate line. It'll create new stops in Hunts Point, Morris uh, Park Chester, Morris Park and Co-op City, and then connect up into New Rochelle. Um, this is very important for us in terms of labor access. These are very dense 
um, historically transit underserved uh, neighborhoods that have uh, high concentrations of people working in the Bronx, in, in other Manhattan boroughs, but also heading north uh, into Westchester and, and Stamford. Um, but it's also important because Morris Park is one of the fastest growing uh, commercial uh, districts in the Bronx. We have Albert Einstein Hospital, Montefiore, uh, the Hutch Metro Center, uh, a very significant healthcare uh, uh, and bioscience node that's growing in, in Morris Park with increasing investments. So we're thinking a lot about the future of the Bronx and the future of the East Bronx as an economic development and workforce growth opportunity, but clearly thinking about this in isolation from its opportunities to extend economic development up the, up the line and think about corridor connections for, employer, for employers uh, and workers is, is increasingly something that we're thinking about um, and something that we want to, we're, we're continuing to have conversations with Westchester and our, and our fellow institutions about how to realize that potential. Um, and I'll end on one final point. I mentioned this is data that we're creating not both to inform our own work, but to make sure that others have access to it. So everything that I've presented in the report, we've also made available uh, in a online uh, um, uh, web portal called the Metro Region Explorer. Uh, in this portal, you can basically click through municipal level, county level, and sub-regional data to see employment trends, housing trends, and population trends. Uh, we think in a few months we'll be putting commuter data up on this website as well. Um, and this is part of our, our, our attempt to create additional capacity towards regional lens. So that anything we're learning, we're sharing with our neighbors, we're making it available and download in, in, in every possible form um, to continue to contribute to that understanding of our regional dialogue. Um, and with that, I think I'll finish. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, how do you interact with RPA? Uh, frequently and uh, uh, um, cordially. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, I think our, we, we owe a great debt of gratitude to Regional Plan Association. They've been the holders of, of the regional cooperative spirit for a hundred years. Um, but I think part of the reason that New York City felt it was important to create an office is that we think we can't leave it to nonprofits alone. It's important for governments to be part of the regional cooperation picture as well. Um, so I think in, in large issues, I think the fourth regional plan, you know, sort of has the right vision. Uh, but we, I think the, the, as with anything, the devil is in the details and, and the city has certainly not endorsed or adopted the fourth regional plan as, as our plan. We think it's intended as an ideas document and it's something that we're looking to but don't, you know, don't fully embrace. And I think, so actually I would say Tom Wright, you know, also said this is intended as an ideas document and really, uh, you know, the expectation <coughs> is that it provides fodder for governments like us to think about our common challenges. Um, so, you know, it, it depends on any given situation, but I, we're, we're, we're collaborators. They've been helpful to us in creating more governmental interaction and cooperation. Uh, and we've been participants with them in some of their uh, efforts to create um, better cooperation on things like resiliency. Um, so so it's, a, it's a collaborative relationship, but they're a different beast because they're not a government and we've you know, we, we, we think our primary constituency is talking to other governments. What you've shown us is sort of the history. Um, do you see the future plan as more of the same, changing the direction that it's gone in the past? Uh, how do you, uh, you, there's not much of the future in, in these uh, slides. Well, you know, I guess I would be a little agnostic. I, I can talk about New York City's future and what we're trying to achieve but I wouldn't presume to tell Westchester what your future holds. I think our role is to be neighbors and, and to sort of talk about our common problems together, um, but I think the future can hold a lot of different things. I think from our perspective, the future that is spelled out in our strategic plans is one where the region continues to grow and accept people from all over the world as we historically have, uh, and find ways for them to live equitably uh, and sustainably in the city or, or surrounding. Um, you know, affordability is, is our hugest issue in the city. Um, the city has made 
uh, extreme commitments to uh, trying to use city investments to change that picture, both on the housing side, but also on the economic opportunity side to bring people up, to create, to invest in industries that, that uh, improve access to middle wage jobs, um, to pr improve access to education, uh, to improve access to services, uh, to protect us against uh, against sea level rise. So I think there's a there's a a vision here that we have for a growing prosperous region um, that we hope our neighbors all embrace, but requires some real thinking about how we how we meet it and how we make uh, investments that that really facilitate that, particularly in the face of this changing geograph geography of where where jobs appear to be going and where our workforce appears to be going. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you for Appreciate having me. Appreciate your information. I don't think any other business? No. Okay. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you everybody.